अखंड मंडलाकार व्याप्त ये नाचर तत्पद दर्शिद ये नस्म श्रीगुर नम अज्ञानतिरांध से ज्ञाजन शलाकय चक्षुर्मीत ये नस्म श्रीगुर नम गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वरा गुरुर्साक्षात परब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुर नम सो There is no particular subject decided today for the satsang. Like uh, Sri Gopal Krishna said, a satsang is sangha and sat. Sat meaning the truth. You Now, when you say truth, is it something to do with speaking the truth daily, or is it something to do with ultimate truth? So the word sat means that which is not asat. Asat means that which is here today and gone tomorrow. I think everything is that way. I, you, we are here today and gone tomorrow. Some live for a long time, some live for a short time, but we are gone. And this world, if you go to Rome and look at the Colosseum. There are just pillars left. Even that has gone. So, a thoughtful person begins to think. You know, I come from a country, India, where for generations, from ancient times, serious people have taken up the subject of understanding the truth. When others were technologically doing well, we were involved in discovering the inner. If much of it is sustained today or not, I can't tell you. But this is what was before, and therefore, the intelligent person—I'm sure we are all intelligent people in some way—are very quickly know what is permanent and what is not permanent. Impermanent, and sat is that which is always there, as opposed to that which is here today and gone tomorrow. And sangha simply means a group of like-minded people interested in finding the truth. While I referred to truth in the ordinary sense of the term first, which is. Does it refer to speaking to daily? I would like to say this: If we cannot stick to the truth in our daily life, it would be a contradiction to search for the universal truth. We are we are 24 hours we tell lies, and we are searching for the universal truth. Is this going to work? Not possible. At least you should practice it in daily life to the best extent possible, unless you are a lawyer or a politician. So this is important to note. Why I'm saying this is because in the ancient teachings, the search for the truth is accompanied by a changing of your lifestyle. How to live? These are called the yamas and niyamas of existence. Without practicing yama and niyama, one cannot move because what we are looking at is not intellectual speculation, but actually coming face to face with that which is real. This has been the core of India's philosophy, teachings, and mystic experience, proved by so many generations. Of great rishis who actually touched the truth and came back and said, "Here it is." So we have all the teachings with us. Atul ji, you were introducing, said that there are different paths like karma, jnana, bhakti, and so on. If I go a step further, I would say that as many number of people there are on this earth, there must be that many number of paths to the truth. In fact, it's a generalization, of course, 
some for people fall in this category, some in that, but all of us in some way are the same and in some way are different. And therefore, I think as many number of people are there, that many approaches to the truth is possible. And this is not what I am saying. 2000 years ago, the Rig Veda declared, Ekam Satvipra Bahuda Arjanti, there is only one truth, but the wise may call it by different names. Why would they call it by different names? Because different people would understand it in different ways. And because it's an universal, all-pervading, supreme reality, which cannot be understood by our puny little intellect. Some people think that the Upanishads teach uh, abstract philosophy and it's for the intellectuals and so on. I think the main teaching of the Upanishad is that the intelligent man quickly realizes the limitations of his intellect. <laughs> it takes a hard time for people who are not so intelligent to find this out, but the intelligent man quickly understands that there is a limitation to the intellect. In fact, there is an Upanishad which says that even that which we look for, the truth, even the mind cannot reach. Which means what? If the mind cannot reach, then there is no way out. Yan manasana manyute enahur manovamatam ken Upanishad. It simply means that the ordinary mind caught up in its attractions and distractions has not settled down and become tranquil, cannot touch it. That's what it means. Because if the mind, even the subtle mind cannot touch it, what does it matter to me? It's there and I'm here, that's fine. Carry on. Doesn't mean that. It means that the ordinary mind, which is caught up in distractions and confusion, where the mind does not become steady, where the mind is always floating and depends on the opinion of others for its existence, such a mind cannot find. Since uh, we are on the subject, temples, as to both of the speakers said before, have been centers of learning from time immemorial. Not only centers of learning, centers of worship, and from worship, the next step is learning. Even dance, music, everything is conducted in the temple. In Kerala, every temple used to have something called a kutambalam, which means a place which is reserved for dance and music. So, what does it mean? It means a temple is a cultural center, apart from the worshipping center, so that people come together and share their thoughts, and a temple attracts people who have walked the spiritual path. So you share thoughts with them. This is the most important part. So coming to a temple and worshipping and staying and hearing people talk and having satsangs, soon you begin to realize that we are all temples carrying a spark of the divine in our hearts as the antaryami and walking around. So we are temples which walk. We are not temples which are stuck. Moving temples. So how do we live in this world? What do you do when you come to the temple? You do seva. Now how do you serve a temple which is walking around? By doing seva to the human being. In fact, if you serve the human being, whom Swami Vivekananda called the less privileged ones, Daridri Narayana, then by that serving, by that seva, not only you are not actually giving anything to the other, other guy, he is helping you to clear your mind. Because the more day seva you do, the purer your heart gets. And the purer your heart gets, the quieter it becomes, 
The quieter it becomes, the reflection of the Supreme. The clearer it becomes, I thought it went off. <laughs> uh, the easier for the reflection of the Divine to be recognized inside the heart. Having said this, my original intention coming here, oh, before I was uh, had a discussion with others, was to take up the Gayatri Mantra. Hmm? Because I saw we are going to a temple. There is Padmanabha Swami lying down, as he does in Trivandrum, which is my hometown. And there is a lotus coming out of his navi, so it's called Padmanabha. And here we have Balaji, Tirupati Balaji, sitting on one side. You know, I recently had an, a, a surgery for hernia some time back, and I was taken to the hospital. And I told the hospital, I don't want to have general anesthesia. If I have general anesthesia, I may not come back. So give me local anesthesia. So they gave me a local anesthesia. They didn't allow me to see the surgery, but I could hear everything going on. And after a while, there were two doctors and an anesthetist. Anest what is it? Anest Anesthetist. Whatever. Anesthetist. Okay. Anesthetist. And one doctor who was actually doing the surgery, his name was Ananteshwara. The other who was assisting him was a, actually an expert brain surgeon, but he decided to chip in to help. And I told him, doctor, that this is not the brain, but he said, no, no, I want to be there. We were doing it in his hospital. His name was Vengat Ramana. <laughs> and behind the anesthetist, her name was Gayatri. So in the middle of the operation, the surgery, Dr. Ananteshwar asked me, sir, are you feeling worried or stressed out or fearful of anything? I said, what am I to be fearful of? On the right side stands Ananteshwara, the left stands Govinda. <laughs> And behind me is Gayatri Devi. There is nothing to worry. In the same way, for this surgery here that we are trying to do, we have Ananteshwara on one side, we have Shiva on the other extra. <laughs> and then we have Tirupati Balaji there. I thought I would add Gayatri. There are many Devis here. There is a beautiful Lakshmi here, Mahalakshmi, so beautifully done. Anyway, that's not our subject right now. Shilpa Shastra is a completely different department. Anyway, <clears throat> the Gayatri. I hope I can discuss the Gayatri. Yes. Any problem? Yes. No, no, but when it comes to Gayatri, there are some. Anyway, so <clears throat> the mantra, as we know it, I am very much against people fixing Gayatri Mantra in the reverse horn of their cars in India. This has become a habit. You put a tape and when you reverse, Om Bhur Bhuvasast, this is not the thing. You, you don't chant Gayatri like that. It's a sacred mantra. You don't put it in the car when it reverses back. And they are also in one tune which somebody has sung and is being repeated again and again. Gayatri can't be sung, it has to be chanted. The Chandas is chanting, not singing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, at least that much, instead of pop music. So. Uh, the mantra is Om Bhur Bhuva Swa. It's not Swaha, please. Om Bhur Bhuva Swa. Tat Savitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Yo Yohana Prachodayat. This is the mantra. Now, if we take up the first part, which is Om Bhur Vaswa, 
we can have three satsangs on it. So, we won't go into detail on this, but we'll touch on this slightly before going to the content, the actual matter of the mantra. If I am wrong, please correct me. <laughs> um, oh, first. But we can't not touch it. Because home is the pranava, it's the life of everything. Wherever you go, there is the pranava going on, whether you hear it or not. It's a primordial sound which is there even before creation and continues even when this world is gone. Pranava. Now, you all must have heard in many places, read, that Om is made up of A, U and Ma. So usually it's interpreted A, U, Ma, Om. A being the beginning of creation, creator, U being the sustainer, and M, the last being Maheshwara, the destroyer. Not destroyer actually, because if the old is not destroyed, there will be no place for the new. So it's transforming. Ma. Now this is normally defined this way. But there is an Upanishad which is called, it's a very important Upanishad. It has only 12 slokas. And this Upanishad is kind of the essence of Vedanta and it's called the Mandukya Upanishad. There have been so many controversies on the term Mandukya because Mandukya means a frog. So somebody said some rishi called Mandukya wrote it. Frog rishi. I asked Maheshwarnath Babaji, my guru, what is the Mandukya? He said, you know, simply to illustrate that it doesn't matter this, how the source looks, but the wisdom is more important. The throat looks very ugly. It doesn't matter. What comes out, wisdom is more important. One. Two. The frog is one of those creatures whose life passes through many transformations. You know, um, what is it called? Metamorphosis. Biology. Now, in metamorphosis, first it's in water, tadpole. Then the tail breaks. Right? First it's a brahmachari and a grahastha, tadpole with a little tail here. And then the tail is gone and it becomes a sannyasin. Mm -hmm. So, then what happens? As a tadpole, it can only live on water. When it becomes a frog, it can live on water as well as on land, which is the ideal state of a person who has had the Vedantic experience, not scholarship. We can live anywhere because there is no going in or going out anywhere. Have you seen any picture of Ramana Maharshi with eyes closed anywhere? Because there was no point. There is no going in, there is no going out. Everything is the same. So the frog can live on the land as well as on water and it illustrates the state of a sage who has touched that truth. But we are likely to reject it as a toad, frog. Anyway, that doesn't matter, it's still going on, controversy, why it's called Mandukya. But, why I'm saying this, that Mandukya has another explanation for the sound Om. Mandukya, in its twelve verses, only twelve, is the shortest, does not tell you what to do, what not to do, this ritual, that, nothing. It simply discusses the question, of the three states of consciousness and the fourth through which all human beings pass. And these states don't have a gender, they don't have a race, they don't have color, they do nothing, they are common to all human beings. What are these states? According to the Mandukya, on which the great teacher Gaudapada has written a voluminous commentary 
And Shankara has written a karika on Gaudapada's karika which runs into thousand pages or more. So you can understand how important it is. I'm not saying other Upanishads are not important. I'm just saying, since we are on the subject of Om, the Mandukya describes it this way, that A, the sound A, stands for the Jagrita Avastha. Jagrita means waking state of consciousness, which is common to all of us. I hope now we are awake, but <laughs> generally. The waking state of consciousness. And then the O, Aum, the O, represents Swapna Avastha, dream state, which is also called Taijasa, because in the dream there is no light, your eyes are closed. There is no electric light in there, no external light. But you see the dream in complete light inside. It's self-illumined and therefore it's called Tejasa. So, okay, now look at this dream state. It's very interesting. When you're actually dreaming, do you know that it's a dream? I mean, generally not, sometimes, but most probably not. When you wake up, you say, oh, I had a long dream. Right? And it's surreal when you're dreaming, when a tiger is chasing you, that when you wake up, you're still sweating and palpitating because it's surreal. And at that point, you would not call it a dream. When you wake up, you say, oh, that was a dream. Now, and this is common to all. The great sage Rajarishi Janaka of Videha once had a dream. He dreamt that he was a beggar. And in his dream, he was begging, suffering without food, hungry. And then he woke up. He woke up. He found that he was lying in his luxurious bed in the palace. He was called Rajarishi for two reasons. One is that he was one of the kings among rishis and also a rishi and a king together. Not easy, okay? It usually doesn't work that way. Either you're a king or you're a rishi. So it's a unique example. Because the king has too many distractions to become a rishi. Anyway, so when he woke up, he had this central question in his mind. His guru was the great sage Yajnavalkya. So when he came, he asked him, Sir, please tell me, am I a king or am I a beggar? What if this dream had stretched on for many days? I would have thought I was a beggar. I wake up and I find that I am a king. So which is the real state? Am I a king or am I a beggar? At that time, it was very real to me. So then Yajnavalkya explains to him, that in dream state, the waking state is unreal. Waking state, the dream state is unreal. So they are relatively real and not absolutely real. But there is something which is real, and that is the witness that watches both the dream and the deep sleep and waking state. There is a witness. That witness is real. But the drama that happens around the witness, dream and waking state, are relatively real and therefore not absolutely real. Relatively real, of course. Like we are sitting here, Mr. Ambassador Kapoor is solid, I can't pass through him. We have agreed. But that's in this state. In another state, which may be different. So it's relatively real and not absolutely real. The waking and the dream state. And it is something that we all go through and therefore it's a wonderful lesson to understand that in different states what is real here may not be real in the other. Then you have ma sound, om. The m sound represents what is called shushupti, which means deep sleep. 
You know what happens in deep sleep? One of the reasons why we really relax and are rejuvenated in deep sleep, because in deep sleep, we don't know who we are. The moment I know who I am, my name and my title and my this and my that, I can't have rest. I'm distracted. I say, I'm so and so, I went into a crowd, nobody recognized me. Terrible. But in deep sleep, I don't know. There is no outward cognition. There is no inner cognition. There is no cognition inner and outer together. There is nothing there except deep rest and sleep. But there certainly has been a witness even during that time, although we are not aware of it at that point. Why? Because when we wake up after a deep sleep, we always say, ah, oh, that was so blissful. Who experienced the bliss? I was not aware at that point. So there is an agent, there is someone who has even witnessed that rest of deep sleep and considered it as absolute heaven. Bhur bhua suha. We come to that. Now, Om. Now, these are the three states normally known to mankind, to us. The rishis have said, that there is something called Turiya. Now that Turiya is the Ardha Matra. When you say, Om, see it's represented by a Chandrakala, a small crescent on the top of Om with a small dot on it. That is the Ardha Matra. That is the sound that echoes and goes off as you finish chanting. And that is that which cannot be defined. And that which cannot be defined is the Turiya. And Turiya is not a state, it's rather the witness of all the three states, being free of all the three states and in complete solitude. And yet aware of everything. You can't explain it in any other way. But the way to it, to understand it, is through Sushupti. Let us say that it's possible for us to suddenly wake up in the middle of deep sleep, not wake up, in the middle of Sushupti, deep sleep, if there is an awareness, what happens? That is Turiya. But it can't be. If there was a way of attaining Turiya through sleep, then everybody would have attained it. Unfortunately, no. It's just a, a pointer that this is possible, there is something. So, Om, according to the Mandukya, is a sum total of the understanding that there is a living, free, ever free witness in the midst of all the states of consciousness through which we move. And the moment we start understanding it, even a little bit and moving towards it, we are becoming slowly free of the conditionings of the outer world. And to reach there, different acharyas have given different ways of reaching there. There is the Advaita Vedanta, there is the Vishishta. I am sure if you say Vedanta, most people think of only Advaita Vedanta. Unfortunately, even in India, once I was invited to Harvard for a talk and I went there in the philosophy department many years ago. There were some learned professors there, all whites. And when I said Vedanta twice in the course of my discussion, of my talk, one of them put his hand up. Sir, I said, sir, what do you? Ah, he said, when you say Vedanta, are you referring to the Advaita Vedanta of Shankara or the Vishishta Advaita of Ramanuja or the Dvaita Vedanta of Madhuacharya? Which Vedanta or Nimbarka or any one of these? So which one are you talking about? I said, sir, I'm so, so happy that you asked me the question because in my country nobody asked me. 
I don't know whether they know it or they don't ask it out of respect, I don't know. So, different acharyas have found different ways to understand this. True. But no acharya disagrees on this, that the mind has to be purified. So forget about the definitions. When you reach there, you find out for yourself. But everyone says that the mind is covered by dross, it has to be purified. And if it is purified either through bhakti or through karma or through intellectual and jnana, then it shines forth. And when it shines forth, it cannot be mistaken because as Shankara said, it is that which cannot be defined by any of our normal modes of definitions. Which is why he said not this, not this, not this, until you come to that which cannot be reduced anymore. When you come to the irreducible substratum, which you can't do anything more than it is. So therefore, if that is the case, is there a way to it? Or is it that when we understand that there is no way to it and surrender, it's possible? These are two ways of looking at it. Yes, you have to purify your mind, you have to follow yama niyamas, you have to make your mind subtle, all that is true. But in the ultimate essence, can I do anything about it? Okay, it's like this. Suppose this essence that we seek is all-pervading, suppose. Upanishad says yes. Isha vashya midam sarvam metkincha jagatyam jagat. Last part is difficult. Te na te na bhunjita. Let go and rejoice. That's the most difficult part. But Isha vashya midam sarvam, that reality, that sat, pervades everything here. Okay. Suppose the truth was there and I am here then I can move towards it. I can find out ways. What if it is here? How do I go? It's right here, right? So the great sages have said, when all movement ceases, when all grasping and groping comes to an end, then when the mind is in its tranquil state, let go of all this movement, let go and rejoice. Even in ordinary things, it is it it applies. If you have too much gas in the tummy, let go. Otherwise, you can't rejoice. I'm telling you. Of course, public, we have to be careful. But what I'm trying to say is that tenseness of saying "I am" has to go. When this goes. You don't look for it anywhere, you stop looking and you just settle down. Then the mind in its tranquility perhaps understands this. But unfortunately, we are caught up and crowded by so many things that it is often difficult to penetrate and go inside, more so when we have studied too many scriptures or books. We tend to believe that what we read in the book we are experiencing when actually we are only reading. One doesn't become the Brahman by keeping on saying Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi. Not Aham Brahmasmi. You can't go and stand in front of a speeding train. You have to find out. It's an experience, Anubhava. It's not theory. Uh, I want to uh, tell you how the empty mind, when it is, well, the Buddhists call it shunyata. I have no argument with that. It's called shunya simply because there is no way it can be explained. And it is the same as saying, yeah, dvajana bhutitam, that which words cannot explain. Which means when the mind is completely clear, empty. Now, when I say empty, not only just all our distracting thoughts, also free of its selfishness and self-centeredness and ego. When this is clear, then it's there. There's nowhere to look for it. It's here, there and everywhere. 
So I want to tell you a little story. Oh, we have to go to the Gayatri. Anyway, so a little story about a very great scholar. I'm sure many of you must have heard of Kavyakanta Ganapati Shastri Gadu. Was a scholar. I don't think in contemporary times there was anybody like him. There was no Vedantic understanding which he did not have. He had not read. And on top of that, he was a Sri Vidya Upasaka. He, his interpretation of the Saundari Lahiri is even today beautiful. It's wonderful. And such a person was wandering around because he felt that there was, with all this knowledge, there was some barrier which separated him, finally. He couldn't cut that barrier. So, one day, he came to Tarvannamalai, Sir, Atulji, how much time do we have? Okay. <laughs> so, um, he came to Tarvannamalai, and somebody told him that on the top of the hill, there is, uh, nobody knew Ramana as Ramana Maharshi or anything at that point. Said some Brahmana Swami is sitting on the top of the hill. Can you, maybe he will solve your problem. Try. So he went up. It is said that Maharshi was sitting with his eyes open as usual. But he didn't register this guy coming. He was just sitting. After a few minutes, he turned and looked at him. You know, he hardly spoke. So he put up his hand and did like this, which means what? Shastri, Shastri was waiting for the coup to ask. He burst out fifteen full minutes on all he did. Where he started, what he did, this I studied, this I did, this I did, this I... I think Maharshi must have been counting the number of eyes there, anyway. He said, I did this, I did. Then finally he asked him, Now what can I do? What more should I do? It was a beautiful statement. In Tamil, Maharshi smiled and said, Can you shut up for a while? Keep quiet. Don't talk. If I follow that principle, then there will be no such thing. So, said, shut up and keep quiet. And then it hit him. He understood what was being said. Hmm? The burdens were down. Everything was over. He was washed clean. And then when he came out, he was a different man. And it was he who actually, for the first time, went and spread the word, why are you wasting time? There is a Maharishi sitting up there. And since his name was Venkatravana, he became Ravana Maharishi. So, Bhur Bhuasva. So, Om, sorry, Om Bhur Bhuasva. Now, Bhu is a short form of Bhu Loka, meaning waking state. Again, Bhua Loka, the next realm, which is Swapna. <coughs> and Swa, Swarga, which is deep sleep, Shishupti. Beyond that, to understand, the Gayatri's prayer is, what is beyond these three states, may I understand. For that I need my intelligence activated and stimulated. So therefore, after Om Bhur Bhuvaswa, it also means that the chanting of the Gayatri affects you in all these three stages. It affects you when you're awake, it affects you when you're in a dream. It affects you when you're in deep sleep, if you are chanting. But who chants nowadays? People don't even know that there are three sandhyas. The other day I said three sandhyas. Somebody said, no, there are only two. I said, there are three sandhyas. Sandhya is the meeting place of time. When the shadows lengthen in the noon, that is also a sandhya. You're not even aware of that. Then what sandhya will you do? Doesn't matter. Forget Sandhya on the night, it's a long process. At least you can chant the Gayatri. No. People come to me and ask, uh, I want to take a mantra from you. Okay, what's your name? Uh, Sheshadri. 
That's a typical Brahmin name, Sheshadri. Okay. Haven't you got your Gayatri when you were young? Yes. Then why are you asking me for a mantra? Why don't you chant? He has not chanted it for 35 years. So what did you do in 35 years? I chanted 35 mantras. <laughs> Each mantra for two months or one year. Stick to your mantra and it can carry you through. It has all the things necessary to make the mind clear and awaken your intelligence to understand the truth. So, after Bhur Bhuvaswa comes the body of the mantra, the actual. It says, Tat Savitra Varenyam. I bow down and worship that Savitra, the controller of the universe, which physically is the sun, but actually means the Supreme Being. Sun is here a symbol of the Supreme Being. The controller of the universe, Savitra. I, Varenyam, I bow down to. Again, Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi. Dhi is the root from which the word Dhyana comes. Dhimahi means meditate upon. Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi, that Supreme Lord, Deva, who is ever effulgent, Bhargo, to him, on him, or on it, I meditate. Difficult to say him, she, and so on. On that I meditate. Dio Yohana Prachodayat. May my intelligence be stimulated or awakened so that I can grasp these truths which are so difficult for the ordinary mind to grasp, for the distracted mind to grasp. For the mind which is always caught up in possessions, including physical as well as possessions of knowledge to grasp. May I understand this? If I don't, this is the, well, I, I can't say this is the definition of Gayatri. I can say this is my understanding of it to some extent. Because these are all infinite things. You can't say, oh, this is. You know, there is much more to it. Somebody may know more. The first step in understanding yourself is to realize that you don't know everything. There may be others who know better. That's the first step. Because the moment I start exploring, saying I know everything, there is no exploration. It's finished. The barrier has already been put. So can I, with a free mind, look into this matter. This is the meaning of a satsanga in which today we dealt with the Gayatri. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Yes, sir. I said I just had a comment and a question. The comment is that you mentioned about on the Advaita philosophy where if that which remains is the true, but whereas we tend to use that as if it is the Socrates method of education in academic circles and stating that was done by Socrates, not realizing that these things came way back in the Hindu Upanishad and therefore that needs to be sent to many places. If you are going to universities, please make sure that is my request. Uh, yeah. The qu second question that I have is, why is it that Gayatri Mantram is always referred to as if it is equivalent to the 24,000 slokas that Valmiki made? Where is the connection and where is the reference? Because I have heard people saying that. And if you can explain it to me and to the audience, that will be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will try to explain, sir. To your first statement, which you made, not the question, about Socrates. In fact, among the Western philosophers, among the ancient Western philosophers, Socrates probably was the first person to say, know thyself. And because, of, because he said, know thyself, 
he was made to drink poison and die. Right? So people don't like to know thyself. Dangerous. However, it's true that many hundreds of years before Socrates, which doesn't bring down the value of Socrates, many hundreds of years, the Upanishads said, know thyself. True. I agree with this. The thing is, as I said when we started the satsang, there was a time when in India, the main concern for most people, intelligent people, was to look for metaphysical truths and to find out the truth beyond appearances. So they spent more time in that, while the West was then involved in building up the externals, the outward world, which in some way is useful. Today we have internet, which we can use, of course. But the inner thing was given more importance in ancient times. Therefore, naturally, there is much more to it than after Socrates, but before. There is some very interesting fact which uh, you may know, but I want to say this. Uh, till the time of Dara Shikho, who was the unfortunate son of uh, uh, Shah Jahan, who was, sorry, who was murdered, and you know, Aurangzeb became the ruler of India, the Mughal Emperor. Dara Shikho was a great uh, mystic. In fact, his Ishta Devata was Krishna. And that was one more reason that Aurangzeb found to kill him, because it is against the religion to have any such thing. And Dara Shikho translated the Upanishads for the first time. He didn't. He got a group of scholars got them together in a place called Parimahal, which is still existing in Srinagar, to sit down and translate the Upanishads, principal Upanishads, 11 Upanishads. They were translated into Persian. And then from Persian, they were translated to Greek. And DuPont wrote the first Greek translation of the principal Upanishads called Upanikat. It was when this came out, that the Western world, in those days when you say Western world, I'm talking of Greece and such places, Rome, began to understand that in this country, where they thought people were just walking around wearing loincloths, doing nothing, there was such a storehouse of great wisdom. It was then that they started figuring it out. So, these are the two things I wanted to tell you. And I am being invited to go to Maryland University uh, for a talk, and I'll surely discuss this matter, as you suggested. Uh, the second question, uh, huh, about the Gayatri being equal to 24,000? Shloka. 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 Now you must understand that the 24,000 slokas of Valmiki Ramayana were written by a great sage Valmiki himself and it explains the great character of Rama himself. That's the crux of it. All other battles going, all that, but the main character there is Rama. Now, there is another textbook called Yoga Vashishta. In Yoga Vashishta, it is the teaching that Rama takes from Vashishta, learns from Vashishta, where the central teaching is, Rama, you may be the son of Dasharatha, but beyond all that, you are actually a spark of the Supreme Being himself. And therefore, you are the essence of truth. This is the teaching. Now, the Gayatri mantra, which is so important in the Rig Veda that the whole Chandas is called Gayatri Chandas. You see, because what it asks for is the same thing that Rama got from the Yoga Vashishta, which is, may my intelligence be stimulated and made clearer so that I can understand the truth. So this is why you may not be able to read the whole of Ramayana, but you certainly can chant the Gayatri. <laughs> so.
So, I think so. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, after. Yeah, no, after she was asking. Sure, you're the next. Namaste, and thank you for the knowledge which I got on Gayatri Mantra. My question is that few years ago, and even today, I, think, I used to think Gayatri Mantra is the only Gayatri Mantra the mother of all the mantras. But of late, I've, as when I come to the temple, there's a Gayatri on every deity, okay. on every planet, like today Shukra, so you know, from Prabhu and Chaya and all that. Sure. So are we to give the equal importance to these Gayatris, or is it enough only to recite the mantra? I won't say it is enough or not enough. But I should say that the most important Gayatri is the Gayatri Mantra from the Rig Veda. This is the most important Gayatri. Other Gayatris have also been there, but I don't think they are as old as, as the original Gayatri Mantra. So I won't say you should not chant or give more importance, I'm not ready to say that. But however, I would suggest that the original Gayatri Mantra is the most important of all Gayatris. Because of the restriction on the time, and we have so much time, so if we put that time in reciting those Gayatris, then this You can also simply chant Ram Ram <laughs> during that time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well. Yeah, the question that I have is uh, I have been watching YouTube videos uh, of various masters. And I don't there are too many, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> there are too many, but uh, the information okay, is very okay, useful. Okay. I hope so, that doesn't confuse you. Anyway. Yeah. So the problem is, uh, I don't understand why, understand why my mind, I'm not satisfied and stop uh, going, watching further videos. I want to understand why I'm not satisfied seeing one and... Uh, because this has now turned into an entertainment. And the mind wants to be entertained. So you find something, then you find something new, then you go there. While it is good, at some point you have to stop this window shopping and say, okay, let me go seriously into this matter. There are too many things coming in which can cause confusion to me. So first of all, when you go to, a, when you listen to a spiritual teacher or something, one or two things you have to note. Is, does that person want to give you something or wants to take something from you? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, the checkbook is more important than the teaching. Hmm? Job the one minute, so what you have to think. The job is even worse. So um, <laughs> you have to think of that. The other is, the main thing in all this is not the mystical elements. Like, no yogi can have as many visions as an LSD addict. It's not that. It's how the mind becomes mature. How the mind is tranquil. That is more important than any of the other things. Uh, somebody says, oh, I use material lacing, a rudraksha. You can buy it for ten bucks. You understand? Yes. So, therefore, I'm saying, the most important thing is to figure out how to get the mind tranquil. We have read and seen enough now. I might suggest when you go home, take off the YouTube from your computer for a while. Relax, chant the Gayatri, sit quietly. Today what has happened is because we don't have that cultural anchor in us, all kinds of people mislead us, you know, and take us here and there on a merry-go-round and you end up starting, ending where you started. So, let go. The other thing is like, uh, for, I mean, like, thoughts keep coming. And if you want to settle down all these thoughts, uh, rather than letting it go off, listen to something that is keeping you in the flow. That is what is making me addict to a... Ah, so you admit that it is an addiction. <laughs> yes, I admit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the human mind has a tendency to be addicted, I understand. Why don't you get it addicted to beautiful music, to lovely bhajans, 
kirtans for some time, some change. Try that. And one more thing about mind. You said thoughts keep coming to... Thoughts come for everybody. But you have to substitute thoughts which are positive to thoughts which are negative. People think somewhere along the line there's a misunderstanding that the highest attainment is to become thoughtless. If you want to become thoughtless, you don't have to do any sadhana. Just hit your head with a crowbar. <laughs> You're unconscious. There is no thought. It's not thoughtless. What you need to do is to improve your mind to positive thought. Bring good things into your mind and allow it to be one-pointedly in one stream of thought. Like, like music, for instance. Yes. Study beautiful music. Listen to the flute or listen to beautiful music. And then what happens? Your mind is fully on that, complete attention. That is the time when you realize that there is hardly any thought. Not when you try to... How can I say I'm thoughtless? When I say I'm thoughtless, I'm thinking. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So, for some time, experiment. Mm -hmm. yeah. The proof of the pudding is in the eating it. So, the experiment, experiment, keep for some time, shut off your YouTube, listen to music, chant Om, just keep quiet. You have a supplementary? Yeah. On the other hand, uh, see now uh, after having two kids, if you get into, if you feel like entering entering into this area, there are so many materialistic that things that you definitely want to have, and uh, you keep running behind them. How is that uh, possible to be? No, under? unless you taste that you will not be free of this. So while you are still here, keep trying. Thank you. Yes. Hmm? One more thing is, I am not a monk myself. I have a family. I have two kids. Now they are also married. Now I can take sannyas, of course. But they are also married. So it's not as if I have not passed through this state. I have also, I didn't fall from heaven. Please, I was born from the womb of a mother. But you have realized and then all this No, 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 no. That's not true. Don't think like that. There is nobody exclusive. It's open to all. But we should put our mind to it. Hmm? Sorry. Sri Guru Bhikkhu. You know, Shankara has said, Panarapi Jananam, Panarapi Jananam. So, you know, to you know, we, we get through this cycle of birth and death, we go through this. So, and uh, you know, we always pray, Murti Do Bhagavan, <laughs> always. Right? So, how do we do this? What should I do or we can do to be on the path of Mukti? And also, why is that Mukti is so important? First, you have to decide for yourself that mukti is important. Then only the next steps. If your question of why mukti is important has not been sorted out, I think you should sort that out first. Then only how to get there, the question arises. So think about this. Why is it that people look for mukti? I'll give you one or two examples which is put for thought. Okay? Take a small child. I know that you want, I know that, but I'm just saying for argument's sake. Uh, you take, you catch a child and put the child in a small room. Give the child everything that it wants. But how long can you keep the child inside? It will want to break the window and come out. The early signs of wanting mukti. <laughs> you know what mukti means? Freedom. All freedom struggles have been mukti only, in some form or the other. Here mukti means, in the Vedantic context, to be free of the things that cause sorrow and make us come back again and again. And that means of attractions and attachments that we have. When you see that it is empty, 
that it really doesn't matter, then you want to be really free. And sometimes nature gives us a couple of strong blows before we realize this. For some people it comes at an young age, maybe they were born in a more mature way, I don't know. Okay? When I was four years, five years old, I, be, I was wondering, what is this? So, that doesn't mean that I didn't have to do work. Maybe some point I had done some work which was resulting in this, quite possible. Which now I know, yes, but... So, at some point you get this burning desire. This is the most important thing. You can't create it. <laughs> so, but you have to know then the importance of it. If that happens, then how to get there will work out in some way or the other. There will be a guide somehow. You don't have to run away to the Himalayas. I did. Yes. When I was 19, I ran away. Yes. But that doesn't mean that everybody should run away to the Himalayas. You can find God here, right here. But I had for a special purpose. And the United States, uh, uh, there are so many trees and creeks and beautiful mountains, you don't have to go to the Himalayas. Well, go if you love the Himalayas, that's a different story. But there are lovely places here where you can... Sometimes I begin to feel that spiritual souls will soon be born in the United States. Absolutely. <laughs> We are finding it difficult in our country <laughs> to survive. <laughs> Thank you. You want to ask a question? Yeah, we have a few minutes. You can please definitely work. Thank you. Um, so you were talking about Om and the waking state, the dream state, and the deep rest. I was wondering where um, meditation, the meditative state fits and what the role of meditation is in seeking. Right. <clears throat> meditation is one word which has innumerable meanings. The word used traditionally in India for meditation doesn't have one word. It consists of three. One is dharana, other is dhyana, and the result is samadhi. Nowadays people have even heard of samadhi, they think samadhi is when somebody dies and is buried. Samadhi is the high state of mind where the mind is free of all distractions and rests only on the object which you are fixing your attention on. So it starts with fixing attention, dharana. When dharana continues for a length of time without interruption, then it becomes dhyana. And dhyana, when you are fully involved and absorbed in it, then sometimes you don't even remember that you are doing it, but it's just an experience. This is the beginning of what you can call samadhi. Okay. Now, you also said about Om. One of the best ways, this is not a practical course in meditation, but one of the best ways to meditate, which means meditation is basically, now you understood what I'm trying to say, is to remove all distractions from the mind and keep it clear and open to receive. You can't receive if it is full of muck. It has to go. So there are many methods of doing that. Now, in that, if, one of, if you want to practically do something, there's a beautiful way of doing it just with Om. Which means, close your eyes, sit down quietly, and just chant Om. Softly, you don't have to shout. And while you chant, listen to the sound of Om. In fact, in our parampara, in the Nath parampara, I don't kind of condition myself by saying Nath and so on, but in our parampara, one of the ways of chanting the pranava which induces meditation instantaneously, please don't have to look for the checkbook, free, is, <laughs> is, close your ears and chant home like this. Close your ears and chant home. Give 
lot of stress on the last part also, ma sound. Mm. And when you close your ears, you actually hear the vibration inside your head. Okay? At that point, when you hear that beautiful vibration of pranava, fix your attention in the Bhru Madhya. The Gita, the chapter on Dhyana Yoga, Krishna says to Arjuna, balance the prana and the pana. Sit comfortably. Fix your attention in the point between the eyebrows, Bhru Madhya, and be free. So fix your attention here and chant Om. That will balance the prana and apana. You don't have to go into that. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. I have one question. I would like to know if mantra should be chanted loudly or in the mind. The diff <laughs> there are different ways of chanting the mantra. You can, you can chant it loud. But if you need an internal effect in yourself, it's good to chant it silently, which is called ajapa. Ajapa, japa is important. However, I suggest that when you begin, you chant loudly. Because you'll think I'm going to chant in my mind. But when I sit down, there are other thoughts creeping in. When you're physically chanting, at least you are caught with that. There are no other thoughts at that point. So start with loud and then slowly go within. And then when you have reached a state where you can chant without distraction inside your mind, that is one step ahead. May I bring to your attention that the word mantra itself means secret. If it goes into six years, these three persons here, it's not a mantra. Yes, your question. Sorry. <laughs> so, question on the explanation that you gave for the Gayatri Mantra, right? Um, the question that I have is, what I understood is too much intellectual thinking or the learning aspect of it, right? Could make you too much into the thoughts and mind and all that, right? But in the mantra, the last part, if I understood right, is praying to the Almighty being that to in, to raise my intelligence to a right. right, right, right. To stimulate it for yes, yes, I agree. To be uh, awakened towards the right, God, right, right. So where is the ah yes? There is a difference between intelligence and knowledge. Knowledge is. Who is the small man walking around? Uh, <laughs> the knowledge is something that you keep acquiring and it sometimes becomes impenetrable. Intelligence is the capacity to grasp immediately what is happening. So therefore, when you say intelligence, when the Gayatri says, Dhyo Yona Prajodayat, it means, may it be illumined so that I realize as quickly as I can the limitations of my intellect. Only the intelligent person can understand this. Otherwise, we think we can solve everything using our intellect. It's so limited because the brain is so limited. And the reason why, I'm, sir, I think we should stop with this now. But why it's limited? So I'll go a little more on this. Why it is limited is because, let me explain this. We have the Pancha Indriyas, right? The five sensory organs or instruments of perception. We have only five, all of us. I may have something else, but we have only five, generally. Five instruments of perception we have. Now, all our intelligent thought or knowledge is based on the inputs from these five Indriyas, right? We are saying, that the inputs themselves may be imperfect. The inputs themselves may be sometimes illusory. And therefore, what the brain builds up based on these inputs could be sometimes and many times wrong. Yeah, simple example. Every morning, we see the sunrise. Every morning, every evening, we see the sunset. The schoolboy will tell you, that the sun neither rises nor sets. 
But what do we see with our chakshu, which is the most important organ that we have, that the sun is rising and setting. Right? So is, it, is that not wrong information? It is. Now based on that data, we build our intellectual framework. You see this? So what they're trying to say is look beyond this. <laughs> Go to the understanding that is beyond. Because it's limited. The brain can only think in very limited patterns. However much it can expand, it's still quite limited. And when it is silent and tranquil, then something else takes over, which is what we are seeking. And Sila Ella said. We are honored to have you here. Thank you, sir.